the climate of other worlds, which is what I actually do for a living, is what I study, um, and the climate of this planet, Earth, uh, which I live on and I'm willing to bet most do. I'm embarrassed to say that despite earning a PhD in astronomy, it came as something of a surprise to me when I learned that the very same physics I was applying to the atmospheres of exotic planets orbiting other stars also explain past, present, and future of Earth's climate. This sent me on a journey to better understand what Earth has to teach us about the climates of other planets and moons and vice versa. So I organized interdisciplinary conferences and workshops. I teach multi-departmental classes in the hopes of removing some of these artificial boundaries between these, these fields that are sort of like cousins or siblings. The panelists that we've gathered today are some of the colleagues that have gone the way. Not only are the experts in their own respective fields of research, but they're adept at the sort of interdisciplinary discussions we're gonna be having today which are also the sorts of discussions we need to advance our understanding of climate um, writ large. This is an interactive panel, so we're going to be taking questions from the free to submit your questions either through the Zoom chat or the YouTube chat. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, they're each going to give a, a little spiel uh, as well, but I'm just going to start by giving you the, 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 the quick rundown. So it's Sarah, Sarah Horst. Um, an assistant professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Johns Hopkins University. We have Nicole Lewis, an assistant professor of astronomy at Cornell University, as well as a deputy. We have Ray Pierre Humbert, the Halley Professor of Physics at the Oxford. And we have a, a research scientist at NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Science. So each speaker will now give uh, a short three to five minute summary of how the research relates to the climate of Earth and other worlds with Sarah Horst. So you can unmute yourself. Hopefully Zoom will cooperate. Um, okay, yes. Someone's nodding, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm in the Department of Earth and Planet Hopkins. And so we have a lot of interdisciplinary conversations here I think of the type that, that Nick has been highlighting. Um, the work that my group does, is, but also we've been working on solar planets um, and chemistry, and in particular, how gas phase molecules get converted into solid particles in atmospheres, um, which we call haze. Those processes are analogous to the formation of smog here on Earth. So, um, and we're also interested in clouds a little bit. And the reason that we're so interested in those processes is because particles interact with differently than gases do. And so when you have particles in an atmosphere where clouds or particles, they end up in the atmosphere, what type of light um, gets posited in different to the surface, if any, in different um, wavelength regions. And that matters for a lot of reasons, right? So that, de that determines the temperature structure of the atmosphere um, that has a big impact on what the temperature is at the surface of a planet. And so that can have an impact on whether or not, for example, liquid water might be stable on the surface of the planet. Um, that also then has an impact on some things that I think some other folks will probably talk about. So the dynamics of the atmosphere, how parcels of air can move through the atmosphere. And so it's really important to understand um, exactly how light is interacting with an atmosphere. And to do that, we have to know things about these particles. But it can be kind of challenging um, because you have to know a lot of information about the particles to be able to model these effects. And so one of the things that my group does here at Johns Hopkins is we do laboratory experiments where we simulate the conditions that are happening in these atmospheres. Um, so the temperature, the pressure, uh, the different background molecules, um, the gas molecules of the atmosphere. And then we put energy into 
those gases and simulate this conversion of the atmospheric gases into different types of particles. And then we can take those particles and we can do measurements we want. So we can measure the way that they interact with light. We can measure their chemical composition. Um, recently, we've been doing mechanical properties measurements because on Titan, um, these particles end up on the surface where they then undergo geologic processing. And so we use these experiments um, to be able to control the conditions and to uh, measure things that we're not able to measure yet. So even though you know we have been able to measure some of these types of particles here on Earth, um, and we do that quite a bit through different aircraft campaigns or um, filters on various like buildings and stuff like that, um, we haven't been able to do that for extrasolar planets yet. Uh, and so we're using the lab to try to fill in some of the gaps in our knowledge um, so that we can improve our understanding of these atmospheres as we get more and more information about them. Um, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Um, next up, Lewis at Cornell. All right, thanks. Yes, so Again, I'm Nicole Lewis at Cornell University. Um, and Cornell, much like uh, both Nick and Sarah have highlighted, is a place uh, in our astron astronomy department that does a lot of interdisciplinary research, specifically at the intersections of astronomy and planetary science, uh, which is at the heart of what I do. Um, as Nick mentioned, I'm also the deputy director of the Carl Sagan Institute, uh, which really is a interdistitute that brings together researchers from 14 different departments at Cornell uh, to think of how can we build the toolkit for the search on exoplanets. Um, my own research focuses on ways to probe the atmospheres of exoplanets. Uh, using facilities like the uh, Space Scope and in the future with the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, unlike solar system uh, missions that allow you know, Saturn or Jupiter, uh, we can't do that for extrasolar planets. And so we have to think of how can we carefully ask something about the planet's property, perhaps even its climate. Uh, in addition to distant worlds, uh, myself, members of my team, and other collaborators at Cornell and beyond develop a broad range of atmosphere models that allow us to see the kind of signals we might expect from different climates. Um, as we know, Earth's atmosphere plays a cool key role in stability, and so my research really focuses on energies to exoplanet atmospheres and then link that back to the underlying physics and chemistry that's shaping that atmosphere. I'm particularly interested in finding ways to create two and three dimensional maps of exoplanets through observations and use those to provide constraints, um, on, provide constraints on climates uh, for exoplanets. Most of my work has really been focused on hot Jupiters, which are uh, Jupiter-sized planets close to their host stars, but I've also dabbled in recent observations of terrestrial-sized planets, uh, namely the ones in the TRAPPIST-1 system with using the Space Telescope. And there, we were able to uh, rule out the significant fraction of hydrogen in those planets' atmospheres with significant greenhouse gas and would, would affect their climates. Um, I'm really thinking also about how to optimize the use of future ground and space-based telescopes to study the climates of distance worlds. And I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion to think about next few decades hold for us. Thanks, Nicole. Um, next, let's hear from Ray Pierre Humbert at Oxford. Okay, hi, I'm, I'm going to just uh put the video on so I can say hi, but since uh, the sound has been a little bit choppy, I'm going to uh, put the still back up uh, uh, for the rest of the talking. So, uh, 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 We can still hear you, Ray. You can, you, can still, you can still hear me. Okay, somehow I just lost, uh, I lost my Zoom screen, but um, so anyway, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm Ray Pierre Humbert. Uh, I'm in the physics department at Oxford University and physics at Oxford includes everything from cosmology, uh, astrophysics, 
uh, and uh, and atmospheric physics uh, to you know uh, um, particle physics and and all of that. Um, before I came to Oxford, I was in a broad geoscience department, which includes uh, earth science, uh, the stuff that deals with rocks, as well as uh, as well as atmospheric science. The uh, the defining of what I've been working on through my whole career is essentially the the uh, the the unity of physics that determines the behavior of planetary atmospheres. Uh, and I started on Earth Earth climate, uh, worked my way up into uh, the climate of Mars and Titan, and uh, then when exoplanets were discovered, I, this was like a from the gods. I jumped right on it. Uh, but there, it, all of um, all of climate science, all that climate physics, um, all, all of climate physics, really comes from putting together in various combinations the same basic building blocks. And this is this includes radiative transfer, as Sarah was talking about, the way that light interacts, light of all frequencies interacts with an atmosphere and with the planetary surface, thermodynamics, which determines the state of matter in the atmosphere and on the surface, and Newtonian mechanics, uh, Newton's laws of motion, which really determine how atmospheric fluids move from one place from one place to another. Uh, and um, and uh, the, the same basic components determine the climate of, of just about any planet. Uh, we often, uh, there's a very good interplay between study of Earth climate and study of uh, the climate of, of exoplanets or other solar system planets. Because often in a complex system, although we know the behavior, the fundamental building blocks, it's hard to anticipate the collective behavior. So for the most part, we're still very much relying on what we know about Earth. Uh, uh, to our imagination, think about how these processes might play out on other planets. So for example, uh, on know that, uh, that uh, water vapor condenses into, uh, into liquid versus uh, and that that uh, gives the clue more broadly on other planets. Computers uh, believe that we can see rock, like any. Uh, that actually condenses, um, let's see. Uh, hey Ray, so we can some of that, but it's pretty choppy. Uh, what we might try and uh, do is have the, the panelists call in um, for the audio so that at least we have smooth audio. Um, yeah, okay. So with, yeah, okay. So Carolina and, and Kristen are going to send the, the call in information. It might have to be in the same email that we had before. Oh, there you go. Shared it in the chat. So let's. Okay.
Hello? Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by hash. Testing, this is Nick. Nicole here. Okay, we can hear you, Nick and Nicole. Okay, so the call in the call in audio seems to work better. Let's see once all the panelists are back online. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Carolina, do you want us to do like a roll? Is that what you're asking us to do? Ray is entering the uh, thing. Let's try and help Ray. Okay. Um, Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. Awesome. The wrong. So now I can see Mike and let's see. Oh, can't start my video. Well, the silver lining of not having my camera on currently is that I can eat a cookie. Mm. Okay, I think we should better. Maybe it's getting better. I'm not sure. So Nick, why don't I just say a few words to Keeling and then we can move on. Uh, makes sense, Mike. Yeah, go ahead. And those Goddard Institute for Space Science. Go ahead, Mike. Everybody. So uh, as Nick said, I'm Mike away from the NASA Goddard. Uh, we're located in New York City. And uh, thankfully, Nicole, Sarah, and Ray covered all my bases for me. I basically take a lot of what they've talked about and uh, use them in a physical three-dimensional general circulation model we call Rocky 3D. And our model came from an Earth climate model that my institute's been working 
35 years that she used to do climate change studies, which are, of course, extremely popular and important these days. So what we do with our model is we, uh, we use it to look at Earth through time, Mars through time, Venus through time, and to validate our model at to exoplanetary systems like the TRAPPIST system you've heard about uh, earlier, Proximus and TARP, and various systems. And our group is quite diverse. We work, of course, at NASA, which is a huge place. But in our group in New York, most people are doing a thing. But we have geologists, biologists, photochemists, radiative transfer people, uh, cloud convection specialists, uh, you name it, uh, ocean dynamics, you need to have. We have all these things and all these kinds of knowledge uh, all together, together to, to improve, to improve our model. And make it a better together. And hopefully we can move on. Questions. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, so let's let's get started on questions we had for the panel. So we're going to sort of probably a useful thing, which is what do we mean when we're talking about the moon's uh, climate or, or any system planet? You know, we talk about climate, we throw this word around. But clearly, we don't mean exactly Hong Kong. So maybe you want to give us get us started on what we mean by climate. Sure, I, I can get get us started. Um, I think it, I'll start by saying climate to all of us, specifically in climate. I'm considering the sort of large global temperature and wind patterns that are are really the result of a really complex, the bulk proper of that planet um, that are shaping uh, and temperature and winds that uh, then affects the ability for something like the surface of that planet to support liquid water and potentially life. Great, thanks. Um, uh, let's see, Sarah, what do you mean by climate when you talk about climate? Yeah, that's a good question. I think Nicole already did a good job of probably what I would have said. Um, but I think, um, I mean, especially for the places that I um, am interested in studying, uh, Titan in particular um, has a really lot of between the surface and the atmosphere. And so um, when I think about climate in the context of terrestrial planets, I think a lot about um, not just what's going on in the atmosphere, how that as a surface, um, but also the interplay between the two and how that determines like temperature, um, humidity, all of the different um, variables that have an impact on how the atmosphere uh, functions. All right, next, let's hear from Mike. Yeah, I, I would say the same. That uh, similar to what Nicole was saying and similar to what uh, Sarah was just saying, we also think about climate in terms of surface and atmosphere interactions. For instance, uh, salt is very important in the atmosphere that helps create cloud condensation nuclei. Those are things that are in our model. Dust from the skin create cloud condensation nuclei for, for rain and clouds. And also we think about the upper atmosphere. We think about atmospheric escape and the effect of ultraviolet and x-ray radiation and how those affect uh, the escape of your atmosphere, for example, depending on what its composition is. And that's, of course, a very important component of certain types of M-dwarf stars, where we find a lot of uh, exoplanetary planets flying about, mostly because of selection effects, as we know, but that's where they are. And so we try to understand all of those processes in our climate models. Thanks, Mike. Um, OK, so to summarize so far, uh, climate is mostly about the, the, you know, temperature at the surface of a planet, I guess, if it has a, a surface and we're mostly objects that have surfaces, 
um, and the, the atmospheric conditions above it, but that can sometimes be a function of some sort of complex interplay of interactions with an ocean and rocks and even uh, space, so space physics and the loss of, of uh, certain uh, constituents to, to Ray uh, connected and can Ray voice some opinions and he's literally textbook about planet Earth. I, I have um, move on and Ray will, will Okay, let's let's move on to uh, another question, and then I'm sure Ray will will with some good insights later. So, um, what does climate? Tell us about exoplanets and solar system worlds. Let's start with, with Mike, since I know that you've worked a lot with climate models in the past. We have to do it a little bit because of what I do, which is quite different in terms of the spectrum and the kind of photons sent to our atmosphere than what we see from most of your world we're discovering around the infrared part of the spectrum. So it's something working well, and that's what they're telling us are correct and that we can validate them. So that's that's very difficult. So, but yeah, exactly what you say. We only have world that we know in the universe that has global conditions, and we have to use this world as our kind of benchmark to decide, you know, more or less what what we can look for in a sense, at least in this early stage of of hunting for astrobiological objects in the universe. All right, and next. Uh, what 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 can earth i mean i think you know one of the most things has been really nailing down a lot of the fundamentals um from you know the fact that we have so much data from earth and i think you know one of the biggest challenges we have in studying planets in the solar system with extrasolar planets is just a lack of data. And so I think Earth has been hugely important in helping us figure out a lot of, you know, the fundamental principles that underline that underlie how atmospheres work. Um, and then, you know, now we have the opportunity to those ideas in different space space. So, you know, different stellar types, different atmospheric compositions, different gravity, different all the things and they learned a lot about you know what's fundamental in these equations um, but i think that, you know all of that originally came from yeah so earth is the exoplanet that we have the best data for basically um okay uh nicole can you uh, what are your thoughts on what earth teaches about other planets. Yeah, so I, I mean, one of the great things is that it's very data rich, which is sometimes a pro and sometimes a con because you get a little too comfortable with having all the data you need. Um, and so it doesn't always push you necessarily to think outside the box. But I think one thing to also highlight is that we, we have a fairly good handle on how Earth's climate has changed over time. Um, and that's really important for understanding the broad range of climates that we might expect uh, for other Earth-like or terrestrial planets around other stars, even other G-type stars. Um, so again, the Earth is going to be our, our first uh, experiment when thinking about the range of possibilities that might exist beyond you know, the solar system. Oh, by the way, Nick, I, I finally managed to connect by uh, telephone. Uh, is my audio coming through okay now? Yeah, we hear you loud and clear, Ray. So do you want to give us on, on what Earth can teach us about the climate of other planets? 
Oh, sure, yes. I mean, I'll start by repeating the, the, some of the stuff that got cut off in the Internet problems that, uh, that, that really system, uh, even though it's the same basic physics uh, that's accounting for the, the, the climates of all planets, it's a little bit hard to anticipate what the collective behavior is. So we rely very much on Earth climate to give us ideas of things should be generalized. So, for example, uh, we generalize for condensation of vapor to make rain and snow on Earth to condensation of, um, of um, methane to make uh, to make uh, rain on Titan or condensation of various things that we control consider rocks like quartz silicon dioxide that make snow particles on um, on hot Jupiters and uh, and, and lava planets uh, and and similarly uh, one of the things I've been working on has been the long-term regulation of carbon dioxide on planets and uh, uh, our, our whole idea about this comes from study of how the Earth's climate has changed over the last Four billion years in response to the changing of, of the brightness of the sun. It involves a chemical reaction between carbon dioxide, water, and certain kinds of rocks, called rock, uh, on the surface of the earth. Uh, and, and these are universal chemical properties which would also happen on other exoplanets. Uh, and so uh, right now, earth is teaching us about things that we need to buy. Uh, we'll be able to confront uh, the predictions of these kinds of theories uh, with what's uh, planets, and uh, and then that will help us uh, re really refine the theories and imagination to think about things that don't happen in the solar system. How to cut that? of that with data from exoplanets. So uh, at this point, uh, uh, it was good. There's only the four panelists the free for all discussion part, which hopefully won't look like anonymously. Uh, so I'm going to ask a follow-up question. You're all free to kind of dive in and whatever you want. So I guess because I primarily study planet Earth, I like to imagine Earth, what we think stands on the Earth. Um, I like to imagine soon Earth by seeing that you know, sort of, I, I'm not giving enough credit to the Earth. And so in what ways do you think uh, the Earth still has some surprises for us? And maybe at some point, you know, 10, 20 years in the future, we'll learn something about the Earth that we don't yet know about the Earth's climate, and we'll be like, oh gosh, now finally all these things we've been seeing in these other planets start clicking together. Or, or on the other hand, do you think that we basically do understand Earth climate and, and uh, you know, really the, the information uh, flow is, you know, we've, we have already learned everything we need to know about Earth climate. Like, are there any surprises in store for Earth climate? I, I could jump in on that one. Uh, the uh, I think there are plenty of surprises in store for for Earth climate. For example, uh, the, uh, we, we don't really understand what's uh, very thoroughly what's going to happen to clouds uh, as the uh, as the climate warms. And there are some credible uh, calculations that indicate that low clouds could suddenly dissipate uh, as you increase the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which would then give a tipping point or a kick over into a, into a much more climate. It's really very uncertain whether this would happen on Earth, uh, but uh, but there could be uh, but but it, it is a, a a possible surprise in the climate in the climate system that's very hard to rule out. I think other other big surprises in the Earth climate system uh, would be in terms of the carbon cycle. Right now, carbon right now land ecosystems are taking up a, a fair proportion, all but maybe a quarter of the carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere by fossil fuel burning. Uh, however, uh, at some point you start to get wildfires and bacteria start to decompose that carbon fast and biology puts it back into the soil. Uh, and so there's a question of whether the land will suddenly start putting carbon back into the atmosphere in addition to fossil fuel burning and maybe keep going 
and, and tap into ancient carbon in the soils and peatlands and things like that. Uh, there, there can be big surprises. But I, I don't like to sell exoplanet climate study as a way of learning more about Earth. I think that actually, you know, it, it can jog your, your thing into new channels. But I think the main reason to study exoplanets is for the, you know, the intrinsic excitement of it. I, I don't think it's the most likely way that we're more about uh, what prizes store for Earth. But there, but I think it's not the main exoplanets. Do any other panel have thoughts on climate? I guess I'll jump in um, from the exoplanet side of the fence. I feel like I'm going to teach us is how unique is the Earth's climate, right? So in the on, that's one of the areas that will help textualize uh, Thanks, Nicole. I can see this reminds me of a thought about Yeah, we can hear you, Mike. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, yeah, I agree with everything Nicole and Rick. Maybe it's one in a billion, maybe it's one in a trillion. Um, how did the planets start to evolve in time? About how we got from these very thick and CO2 atmospheres to a nitrogen dominated atmosphere. Are those, are those ideas and models correct? I'm, I'm very excited by the, the possibility that deep exoplanet studies are going to tell us a lot more about early Earth's climate. We'd really like to know how this planet became habitable, and it's not clear that we really fully understand that. Uh, Sarah, do you have any about Earth and whether, whether we may yet learn more new stuff about Earth? Yeah, I mean, I do actually think there's a possibility for it, and and it's interesting because of the example that Ray brought up about the cloud. You know, look at the IPCC reports. One of the biggest sources of uncertainty in Earth climate modeling, and in particular in predicting what's going to happen as the planet warms, is the impact of aerosols on climate. So the haze particles from smog, from uh, burning, all of those things, and also clouds, um, which are related. And we haven't had um, we haven't really had impetus to try to understand the really fundamental underlying principles of cloud formation and um, particle formation because we have a lot of data for Earth, um, and so you're able to parameterize a lot of these processes and models. But of course, that gets you into trouble when you start moving into new phase space. Um, so higher CO2 concentrations, higher temperatures, all of those things. And so I think as um, the planetary science and astronomy community starts really pushing to understand um, the role of particles in atmospheres, there's the, the possibility that some of that will, will feed back into our understanding of, of Earth's climate um, if we're able to kind of tease out some of the fundamental principles of how these things work, um, and then we don't have to parameterize as many things in these models. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so, okay, so n now let me ask uh, my, my follow-up question, which which I think picks up on on something that that Nicole um, raised, which is one of the one of the interesting uh, um, the kind of promises of of studying exoplanets is we can see how common are Earth-like planets. Uh, is it is it very rare to have a planet as liquid water at its surface where life can get a foothold, or is it is it fairly common? Um, so based on what we know on Earth, on, on Earth, you know, geologists tell us that there's been liquid water at the surface of the Earth for, for most of its, you know, four billion years uh, history. And so does that necessarily mean that, that uh, clement conditions are common um, out, out there in, in, uh, in outer space around other planets? And again, you can, you can dive in where you wish. 
to actually, uh, uh, do people hear me? Am I unmuted? We hear you, Ray. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say actually, um, uh, I think that uh, one uh, the biggest one big question about liquid water uh, and whether it's common uh, applies to low mass stars, so called M stars or red dwarf stars, which go through a very intense phase where they're extremely bright when they're young, really fry their planets before they settle down into their sort of long term uh, brightness, which is a lot uh, a lot dimmer than their initial stages. Uh, M stars, these low mass stars, are the most kind of the common kind of star of the universe. Uh, and so if, if these M stars can include water on the surface, uh, then there's really abundant um, habitat for life to emerge throughout the universe and time for it to emerge because these stars are very long lived. So, so uh, I, I think one of the big questions is whether um, is whether a planet around M stars, around low mass stars, can retain liquid water. I think it's extremely likely that for sun-like stars, which are less common than the M stars, the planet liquid water at the surface. Water is one of the most common because hydrogen is the most common thing in in the universe. And uh, oxygen is one of the, uh, is after helium, one of the more uh, ma made by stars. The helium's not made by stars, but the oxygen is made by in, within stars. So, uh, so there's all you can make a lot of water very easily. And I think the problem is more likely for for G stars like the sun that you might have too much water uh, rather than too little water. But for M stars, uh, it's quite likely that their planets could all be just completely dry if they're rocky planets. Thanks, Ray. Do, do any of the other panelists have thoughts on whether the long-term seeming climate stability on Earth uh, should give us hope for uh, the habitability of exoplanets? I, I, maybe I'd like to say something quickly about that. Um, I always enjoy going to talks at geophysics conferences um, on plate tectonics and the, and the beginning of plate tectonics on Earth. And there's a lot of people thinking about how it started here and what was it like three and a half billion years ago. And I always ask this question. I mean, we, as we've already said here, Earth has had temperate conditions for most of its history. We know we've had some form of volatile cycling for most of its time. So I don't think there's any argument that this planet's had volatile cycling, probably plate tectonics for most of its history. And I would hope that uh, other planets that have very ge similar, similar geochemistries to Earth around sun like stars and in their habitable zones should behave similarly. So I, I would hope, as Ray's saying, that it's more a question of whether they get too much water or too little water. What is too much water? Um, that's a good question. What does it mean to have too much water? Um, some people think that life began at the, at the spreading seafloors on Earth. Uh, it's, it's not clear that's true or not, but maybe life gets there, but it's hard for life to evolve into more complex forms later on. Can you have volatile cycling? There's a lot of papers in recent years on, on, on the possibility of volatile cycling. Water worlds, I think the theory is still out on that. But it's something we should, and then the other side is, as Ray was saying, it's not clear that M dwarfs will be able to uh, maintain this. And there's a lot of question about how long can the outgas go on so that they might have atmospheres later on, et cetera, et cetera. I think the jury is still out on whether these M dwarfs have atmospheres. But as he said, if we start putting atmospheres around these M dwarf uh, planets, I think that could be very exciting and that opens up a huge uh, parameter space of possible habitable worlds, which is why we all study them and are excited by them. Yeah, actually I want to jump in with a shout out for one of Nick's papers um, uh, on, on uh, the interesting possibility that in, uh, an M dwarf might be able to retain its ocean by basically dissolving the ocean in the in the interior in the mantle rock and then slowly outgassing it back again after it's safe after the after the star has cooled down and so this all sensitively depends on uh, whether this you know, for regenerating an ocean can work depends on the relative time scale for losing your ocean to space versus the time scale uh, for first uh, sucking your ocean into the mantle and then uh, and then outgassing it back again. And it's a wonderful example of the importance these days of, of thinking about volatile cycling, the, the interplay between atmospheres 
and planetary interiors. The two don't uh, exist in isolation. So, so geology definitely has to be brought in. Geology and geophysics, geochemistry has to be brought into our study in a big way. Thanks for the shout out, Ray. Uh, let me let me continue on on a theme that that Mike uh, brought up by by putting Nicole Lewis on the spot. So so you know there's this question. So Ray and both ask you know do planets orbiting red dwarf stars even have an atmosphere? Do they have water? Um, can you describe to us a little bit like how we could have that water on an exoplanet that's you know tens of light years away? Sure. Um, we, we've tried this, although our results are, are inconclusive at this point. Um, but for in dwarf stars, they're small, which is good, um, relative, they're about the size of Jupiter, actually, um, you know, compared to the sun, which is actually quite large. And so when you have a small rocky body um, near one of these, you can actually uh, measure properties of that planet as they pass in front of and then orbit around their host stars. Uh, this is a method that's typically called uh, transiting exoplanet detection, um, where they pass in front of and then go behind their host stars as seen from Earth. And what we can do is try to look for signatures of those M dwarf atmospheres by the light that perhaps filtered, the starlight that uh, through the factors that will dent on their uh, signatures of things like water, actually. So on to sort of the um, we think we can achieve with Hubble, which was never designed to be exoplanets. Uh, and really, the next, especially with the TRAPPIST system to be used, the Webb Space Telescope to do a similar probe to figure out, do the TRAPPIST-1 planets have substantial atmosphere and what those atmospheres are made of? Um, and beyond that, we're going to have to start employing lots of different methods to, to probe and look for these fingerprints of molecules in exoplanet atmosphere. Yes, hello. Is my sound coming through? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. So, um, okay. Uh, actually, I, uh, I don't want to talk again until, until uh, the others have had a chance. Is there anybody else that wants to say something about the you know, detection of uh, water or atmospheres? So I had another comment on it. Okay, so I'll just go ahead, uh, so I'll just go ahead with my with uh, a follow up to some of the things other people have said. So, so I, and I, uh, I, I said that uh, an important question is whether uh, is whether uh, planets around uh, 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 low mass star M dwarf stars could retain water uh, or atmospheres in in general. Um, but uh, I can actually re refine that. Uh, I could refine that a little bit. Uh, by by uh, saying it's not so much a question of whether uh, they can retain some kind of atmosphere, as whether they retain some atmosphere that without having too much atmosphere. So, for example, one we we actually know that lots of vaguely Earth-sized or somewhat larger than Earth-sized M dwarf planets uh, do have atmosphere because you can measure the density of some of these planets. 
uh, but uh, because if you have the um, the uh, size of the planet from a transit method detection and the mass of the planet uh, from a radio velocity detection, the the wobbliness of the star, you can get the density. And so we, we actually know planets like K218b, which are somewhat larger than Earth and have a really have such a low density, they have to have a very extensive uh, envelope, which could be water or could be hydrogen. The problem with those planets is that they have so much atmosphere. Uh, that uh, that uh, down at any solids you might have would be just uninhabitably hot. Uh, and so uh, um, so what we have right now are rocky planets with an atmosphere of, you know, say, 100 Earth atmospheres, uh, those uh, thin atmosphere that uh, are possibly conducive to, to habitability. So it's a little bit like the question of oceans. Uh, you know, can you contain an atmosphere around a rocky star planet without having too much atmosphere. Because we want to keep an atmosphere have found initially so that after you boil a lot of it's happening I'm unmuted. Somehow I was muted before. Um, oh, so uh, hopefully everyone can hear me this time. Yeah. Okay, good. I think I got a nod, Mike. Um, so next question is, uh, what could exoplanets or solar system worlds teach us about the climate of Earth, both the past, present, and future climate of Earth? And uh, we can start with, I don't know, Ray. No, not Ray. Let's start with Mike. Ray's talked a lot. Let's start with Mike. Mike, we, I, I can't hear you. I unmuted, it says now. Oh, good. Yeah, now we hear you. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. It keeps muting me. Um, I think I've touched on it already a little bit, uh, but I, I think there's a I think there's a, a huge possibility for us to learn a lot about the early clan, possibly Venus and even Mars from exoplanetary studies. I think that's exciting things from my point of view. If someone is really interested in looking for the worlds within our own solar system. There's a tremendous opportunity to to learn about, as I said earlier, how these worlds evolve in their very early part of their histories, and how, and how they got to where they are now. And of course, as as Ray was touching on earlier, how much water do they have? And your own work, like, you know, were they able to hide their water for long enough uh, and then bring it later? All of these things are things that I'm very excited um, by learning from, and I think. It may not happen before I retire. It's going to be a while till we get the, the data for these observations, but I'll be very excited in my retiring years to read what you young people are working on. Thanks, Mike. Uh, next, let's hear from Nicole. Sure. Can you hear me? We can't, we can't hear you, yes. Great, great. Um, yeah, I, and for me, I, I, think, I think there is a ton we can learn about Earth's climate trajectory from exoplanets. And, and when I think about it, I think about 
what happens when we get enough of a statistical sample of other terrestrial planets out there and what their atmospheres are like? Do we commonly see more planets that have atmospheres like Venus, or do we commonly see more planets that have atmospheres like Mars or Earth? Um, because these are all different members of states for terrestrial uh, exoplanets. And for me, I, I just want to get out there and see, is there any commonality um, that might tell us that, you, you know, we're headed in the direction that's inevitable in the universe? Um, or is there just a lot of variety out there um, and that each terrestrial planet kind of has its own trajectory uh, in its atmosphere and potentially supports life? I mean, I, I think I agree with, with what happened, which is maybe not surprising. Um, but, you know, it'd be, I you know that we do have this amazing amount of CO2 um, on Earth, and then you know, understand that there are things that you know, will happen as it's hotter, but we don't have a good sense of where the, the various points are, um, other than what we to gain from models, which have a number of uncertainties, especially Um, but I think it would be really, really useful to understand um, what happened to Venus. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and last, let's hear from from Ray. So earlier, Ray said that that the the main reason we should be studying exoplanets is out of sort of curiosity to try and understand how physics works and how planetary climate works writ large. Um, and that, you know, we're unlikely to learn too much um, about Earth's sending exoplanets. So do you see places where either exoplanets or maybe solar system planets have taught us something or, or may yet teach us something important about Earth's climate? I have a connection, but um, is my uh, computer audio coming through okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, does anybody hear me? Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Uh, so I, um, yeah, I, I, I just meant to say that uh, that studying exoplanets isn't necessarily the best way to say resolve the questions we have about uh, global warming and how warming is going to end if we double CO two. Uh, but uh, but there are definitely things we can learn about the great sweep of Earth climate history by studying exoplanets. One of them, for example, is this um, silicate weathering thermostat, this reaction between carbon dioxide and rocks that we believe uh, maintains uh, carbon dioxide on time scales of you know, millions of years or so. It doesn't save us from global warming or anthropogenic climate change, but, but it is what supposedly kept the Earth habitable over the past 4 billion years most of the time. But we don't really know uh, a lot about the details about how this works and, and whether it works generally. So, so by getting a census of other rocky planets and determining how many, uh, what, what their carbon dioxide levels are, uh, that will give us a lot of important data for determining how general uh, this uh, carbon dioxide regulation mechanism is, whether, whether Earth has something special or whether it's very general. Similarly, on the Earth, we fell into two global glaciations, uh, or uh, one global glaciation early on, uh, and then a pair close together about 600 or 700 million years ago. Uh, but uh, most of the time, we were fairly unfrozen. But uh, if we see a whole lot of snowballs out there which that are rather similar to Earth's, or getting a similar amount of starlight as Earth gets from the sun, then that's going to tell us something about the things that have kept us out of snowballs. 
And finally, something that does actually start to come down to uh, things that are pertinent to global warming is the runaway greenhouse phenomenon. So uh, Venus, it was thinking about Venus that taught us that planets could go through a catastrophic runaway greenhouse due to the runaway water vapor feedback. But water vapor feedback happens on Earth. It amplifies climate change, but it doesn't actually cause us to lose our ocean to space. Uh, but there's been a lot of very good thinking about just how close the Earth is to a runaway. Uh, it does turn out that it's hard to trigger a runaway greenhouse and turn us into Venus, uh, even with large amounts of carbon dioxide. But it's only because of our study of Venus that we're able to say that probably of all the bad things that will happen from anthropogenic climate change, turning into Venus is not one of them, at least not for the next half billion years or so. Uh, and um, you can think of other examples where thinking outside the box about other planets has, has jogged uh, scientists into thinking about things on Earth they hadn't ordinarily or originally thought about. And thinking about sulfuric acid clouds on Venus did provide some of the early impetus for studying aerosols, which are important on Earth. Uh, and so there are things like that. Uh, uh, stirring the pot by forcing people to think outside the box does sometimes turn around and, uh, and force you to think about something that could be happening on Earth even in the next century. That might not hear thought about. Thanks, Ray. Um, all right, so so next let's, next let's dive into a question uh, from the audience. This question uh, is: What determines the? Unmute oh, myself. I have to unmute myself. Everyone Can everyone hear me, hear me now? Hear me now? Can folks hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, so, so this question is, um, what do, what determines the composition of planetary atmospheres? For example, why do Venus and Mars have atmospheres of carbon dioxide, while Earth and Titan mostly have atmospheres of nitrogen? So let's start with. You spent a lot of time thinking about Titan and its uh, atmosphere. So, <laughs> question. Um, and um, Because of their atmospheric composition, the you know planetary in which special um, planets are changing. Can only methane from the material around Saturn when thing was forming. The particular molecules, and in particular the um, and not having some other things that we might expect to be there. Uh, we don't really know where Earth got its name from. Um, there's a lot of different models um, that predict with the CO2 atmosphere and the Martian CO2 atmosphere. I think um, how terrestrial planets get the spheres is one of the really big outstanding questions um, in the study of planetary atmospheres. and we have a lot of different examples in the solar system. Um, I think that exoplanets, um, just based on their sheer number, are really going to help us um, start to figure out the answer to them. Um, but I think, you know, my feeling is that for most of the planets in the solar system, we don't actually know the answer to this question. Hopefully everyone can hear me now. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. You got a gold star because that's the the first response today that was like really knew nothing about the the um, origin of the atmosphere. So, so I actually just learned a lot from that response. That was great. Um, 
So next, uh, maybe let's hear from uh, Mike, since you study Venus. Uh, Venus is one of these uh, supposedly um, boring, uh, you know, CO2 atmospheres. And I know when I teach this this topic, I'm like, oh yeah, CO2 atmosphere, that's what you expect all planets to have, like by default. Um, so do we understand uh, where all of Venus's uh, CO2 atmosphere comes from and, and why it's different from the other planets in the solar system? Thanks. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Let's see if it works. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I think what Sarah said, we don't really understand the origins of these atmospheres necessarily, but um, things that I often forget is that Venus has uh, by bulk weight four times most nitrogen in its atmosphere, for example. So it has a lot of nitrogen in its atmosphere. The thing is that it has a hundred times as dense atmosphere as Earth, and most of that is, of course, the carbon dioxide. And I think the prevailing theories are that, of course, these similar the and Earth have similar carbon budgets, probably similar nitrogen budgets, although it's hard to quantify that exactly since we don't even know the nitrogen budget for Earth. We know how much nitrogen is stored in the mantle, for example. Depends upon the, the redox state, of course, and how fast acids come out of the planet. But, um, but in a rough sense, uh, what we believe is that most of the carbon dioxide in Venus is actually in its atmosphere and not locked up in its crust in rocks as it is on Earth. And uh, since Venus doesn't have any volatile cycling, the carbon dioxide it did have a similar to Earth at the start, then probably most of that nitrogen is also sitting in the atmosphere and very little is sitting inside. But again, it depends on the redox data, very poor. So it could be it has another four uh, atmospheres worth of nitrogen sitting to learn to be that it doesn't, but certainly some estimates that it is fairly outgassed. From, uh, um, from argon measurements that were made by uh, the Russian veneer and uh, then most volatiles are sitting in the atmosphere or have escaped over Probably happen. We do have estimates that release steam CO2 atmosphere, that atmospheres have quite a bit of water in point in its history. But that right now, it's extremely to the world way due to content of the atmosphere. Thanks from YouTube. Is do we use the same atmospheric models for Earth as for exoplanets? Uh, yeah, most of us do. We're using Earth models and modifying them. Small models are very tuned for Earth. Um, why are they tuned? Because they're highly parameterized models. And so we, we parameterize them to make them fast so we can actually do some calculations. So all of the radiative transfer, as we call it, the photons that come to the atmosphere and bounce off of the surface of the clouds get reabsorbed and, and go back up. Be parameterized to fast if we did it from first as possible. So what, what my group does and many other groups do is they take these Earth climate models and they expand their capabilities, they expand the parameterizations for the rate of return, for the photochemistry, um, for the oceans. If you want to model uh, deep ocean worlds, like in the uh, ocean worlds around Jupiter and Saturn, you have to, to make some modifications, reparameterize your models, and uh, make them a little bit more accurate. So yes, we, we basically, most people are using Earth climate models. People are, are now, and Ray is very familiar with this, to start from first principles, but it's a huge amount of work because Earth climates are, models are extremely sophisticated. I mean, they have these very large, complex dynamical oceans involved. They have, as I say, uh, chemical processes, they have uh, weathering processes, they have surface runoff, you know, evaporation, precipitation, cloud convection, everything's in there. So it's easier, in a sense, to take an Earth model and
like for some reason you become muted. But <laughs> that that let's 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 segue from what you were answering because I think Nicole Lewis also runs global climate models, which I think are also also have an ancestry uh, here on Earth. So let's hear Nicole's thoughts on that. And then, well, you're getting a double billing because I want to segue into another audience question, which is when are we going to get our first spectrum of an Earth twin? So uh, Earth eyes orbiting a sun-like star, not them, but a sun-like star. Go ahead, Nicole. Nicole, you are muted. Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right, there we go. Uh, we'll get this figured out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, in terms of global climate models, I, you know, most of us do start with something that has heritage uh, from Earth climate models because there's been a ton of work in just building the basic physics into a framework that's efficient enough to study such models. Um, but many of us have also taken the approach of like ripping out all of the parameterizations that are there and then slowly putting things back one at a time to see if we can better understand how all these things and each other sort of giant black sort of infrastructure. Um, so, you know, basic physics in terms of how fluid flow, radio transfer work should be the same across all planetary atmosphere. Um, it's very difficult. Um, and this is also where I want to highlight when it comes in. Um, you don't always have to start a global population model. It's important to have lots of different uh, levels of complexity in the model. A complex model, we may not really understand what's shaping the points that we have. And so having different models of different levels of complexity um, that tackle things all the way from uh, something as sophisticated as an Earth GCM to a simple um, radiative balance model uh, or energy balance model is useful for studying climate. Um, Nikki, you want me to go ahead on to the... <laughs> Yeah, dive, dive into Earth 2.0. Right. Earth 2.0, yeah. here we go. All right, so um, I, I'm not taking bets here. <laughs> no one can hold me to this. But uh, So this is a very specific question. We measure a spectrum, and so we have to be able to uh, basically be able to see those signatures of the various molecules and aerosol um, and maybe some information about temperature in an exoplanet atmosphere. Um, for an Earth-sized planet around the sun like star. Um, and I think that's really going to take some technological advances. And people are, are really thinking about it. We, we need to push gravity to achieve what we call contrast. Uh, and that's where we are able to suppress the starlight so that we can see a faint thing next to it, right? And so currently, we can sort of see young Jupiters pretty well. They are... Um, the contrast between a, a young self-luminous Jupiter and a star is such that we can achieve that from both ground and space-based telescopes currently. Um, but we have to go several orders of magnitude even further to get to the contrast level of about 10 to the negative 10 between an Earth-like planet and a Sun-like star at 1 AU distance. And so uh, certainly uh, abilities like the Roman Space Telescope <clears throat> that's gonna have a uh, technology demonstrator, what we call a coronagraph on it, will help us to start of build that technological gap. Um, and then <clears throat> after that, we're gonna have to look for um, building a larger telescope to give us that earth, true earth analog, I will say. It will be take us several decades from now. 
Now, I state that, but also want to highlight that people have been very, very creative with the facilities that we've had that honestly were never designed to look at exoplanets. And so um, I would not be surprised if someone comes up with a creative strategy to get such a spectrum sooner. Um, but right now, I'm going to put it at a sort of several decades from now level. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, Ray, I haven't forgotten about you. I have a, a, an audience question lined up for you specifically. Uh, what factors caused the climate of Mars to deviate so drastically from Earth if they started Right. And so, uh, um, uh, thinking about the main thing of Mars is that the main thing about Mars is that it's uh, smaller than the Earth and has lower gravity. And this does two things. Uh, for one, it's easier for Mars to lose its atmosphere because it's less gravitationally bound. But the other thing is that a smaller body cools off faster, or, or to put it more precisely, if you have a certain amount of, uh, of heat made in the interior, decay of uranium and thorium, if you have a smaller body, that uh, that leads to a cooler interior, uh, and so so the interior flow, the flow of the rock and the mantle, is more sluggish, and that means that you have less ability uh, to uh, out gas in the atmosphere. And so we do believe that Mars uh, early on had uh, a CO two atmosphere, which was able to maintain liquid water on the surface. But uh, but now it has a very thin CO2 atmosphere and it's very it's very cold. The feeling is that uh, if um, if Mars had been the size of the Earth and had a similar has now, probably Mars would be happy today. Mars probably have been frozen over when the sun was faint and it would be uh, a habitable planet, habitable. Quite high CO2, uh, an atmosphere is CO2 thawed out, so. Okay. All right, so we have another question from what do we expect to learn the James Webb Space Telescope? Who wants to who wants to learn? Oh, great. Okay, I'm telling you to unmute myself. Um, you, Nicole. Uh, sure. Can you can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yes. Um, with the James Webb Space Telescope, we're really going to have our first opportunity to uh, you know look inside the atmospheres of a broad range of types of exoplanets, um, which I think will help us to just generally understand diversity of exoplanets in their atmosphere out there, both all the way from gas giants through super Earth and mini Neptune, all the way down to terrestrial. Um, for truly sort of Earth-sized planets, we will have a handful of chances to look at those planets uh, for red wavelengths and look for signatures of things like dioxide and water and methane and uh, a few other key molecules that will start to tell us, you know, are those things present um, and in what amount uh, are we seeing them present in the atmosphere. We'll also get hints of things like clouds in their atmospheres from, from the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and the nice thing also of infrared wavelengths is that it can allow you to measure emission from the planet directly. Um, we might get temperatures of some of these uh, rocky planets, uh, especially around M dwarfs. Um, so th there will be a, a lot of uh, excellent studies with the James Webb Space Telescope probing a broad range of exoplanet atmospheres. Um, but the, the rocky ones, we're really going to be focused on planets around these indoor stars, which will hopefully start to answer some of those questions that some of our other panelists have brought up. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, how about you, Sarah? What do you think 
we're going to James Webb Space Telescope. I think that the uh, difference in expertise regarding James Webb between Nicole and I means that I'm just going to defer to her answers to the question. You want to rain on her parade by telling everyone about aerosols? <laughs> no, no. I, 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 I'm just going to defer to Nicole on that one. <laughs> All right, uh, Mike or or Ray highlight that we might learn from the James Webb Space Telescope? Particular in, uh, one thing I'm especially interested in, uh, as I said, it, an important, there are any rock atmospheres. And uh, it may be hard to even with James Webb, what kind of atmosphere it is. But if a rocky planet has no atmosphere, if it's a big, uh, the day side heats up so much, it shines a red beacon. And so with James Webb, uh, it, it will be possible to make a catalog of which M star planets are bare rock walls and which one kind of Put that together with you know which ones that has your uh have too much atmosphere. Let me you put um, the planets uh, in front of the web to see which planet planets did. Are. Okay, um, but at the the top of the hour, um, so thank you for for uh, living. Sorry for all the technical hiccups. Needless to say, this. At some point in the future, we would like to do something like this in person here in Montreal. Um, uh, in fact, I should I should mention this is the first in a series of three climate through deep space and time um, panels that we're that we're doing. Uh, really, depending on how long we stage them over, uh, we might eventually be able to do some of these in in uh, in person after the pandemic. Um, I, I want to thank again. McGill Institute and McGill's Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences for hosting this panel. Um, a big thanks to Carolina and Kristen for actually handling the logistics and keeping us afloat despite all the weird glitches. Uh, and uh, thank you to all of you on YouTube who uh, stuck with us um, through uh, through the weirdness of uh, Zoom international uh, panels. And uh, thanks again to, to all the panelists holding off on eating lunch or eating dinner in Ray's case. Um, and uh, take care, everyone. Stay healthy. Bye. OK, but goodbye, everybody. It's dinner time. Bye, Ray.